Well, good morning. You can do better than that. Good morning. It is so good to see you. I want you to stand up, and I want you to, uh, if you don't feel comfortable going to shake hands, wave at somebody and make sure they smile this morning before, before you turn back around. And you keep smiling as we praise the Lord this morning. Do that for me. so glad that you're here with us today uh, and those that are watching by way of uh, online or will watch it later we're so glad that you're here our purpose today is to bring glory and honor to our Heavenly Father and our prayer today because we can't do anything for you it's only the Holy Spirit that changes lives and so we pray that you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place today if you are visiting with us we want to thank you for being here we know there are many other places you could be so we feel honored uh, that you're here and we'd like an opportunity to meet you before you leave in front of you is a little white card if it hasn't been drawn on 
And uh, if you would fill out, if you're a guest of ours, fill out what you're comfortable giving us just so we have a record of your attendance. Uh, if you're a member or you are a guest and you have a prayer request, we would ask that you put that prayer request on there um, and uh, place it in the basket as you leave today. And we consider it an honor uh, and a privilege that you would allow us to join with you in prayer, partnering with you in prayer to see what God is going to do. You know, 2021 was a, was a tough, tough year for many, wasn't it? I'm thankful to be here. I almost died, and I'm thankful to be here. But I look at all that, everything that the world says is bad. I mean, God has brought so many blessings out of that. Uh, I was able to lose 40 pounds. That was good. I've gained half of it back. And, uh, but I'm thankful to be here. God gave me a verse for this new year, 2022. I know a lot of people think New Year's resolutions uh, are, are silly. But if you never start, you'll never attain, right? And so uh, I want to share with you uh, the verse that God has given me for this year. I had it right here. It is Psalm 9-1. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all his wondrous work. The word God has given me for 2022 is gratitude. No matter what you've been through, the most horrific things, there's always God in the midst of it. There's the Holy Spirit that moves. And you're able to see something positive come out of that. Where the world says, you don't deserve that, it's nothing, God says, I've got you and I've got this. Pray for the folks in Boulder that have lost over a thousand homes. We went through that when we were in Colorado Springs. And while people lost everything they had, we had them coming to God's church where I served. And we were able to lead over, over 35 or 40 to the Lord that thought they'd lost everything. But in losing everything the world gives, they gained everything in eternal life through Jesus Christ. Amen? And so don't look at the negative like the world does. God expects us to, to walk higher, to walk in victory and walk in abundance. And so uh, that's my prayer for us and that's my prayer for you this year is that uh, God will use you to be light in a dark, dark world. We've got uh, many of you know Brother Scott Gorowski is here and his beautiful family. Excuse me, guys. The handsome and the beautiful ladies are here. You'll want to say hello to them before they leave. Uh, Les will give a, a formal uh, introduction right before the message. But pray for them today. Pray God would give us open hearts to hear. Pray that God would give us spirit ears and spirit eyes to see and to hear what he has to say to us through his servant today. We're going to continue to worship after I pray. And uh, I really do want us to be a church that worships in spirit and in truth. You know, we can worship with this up here. A lot of what we know is here because we grew up in church, but it's never made its way to here. When it makes its way here, we become a different person. We become a little more like Christ. And that's my prayer this year for us, that the Holy Spirit of God, He says, if I be lifted high, that's our heart. He says, I will draw all men unto myself. My prayer is there'll be a day soon that people are driving by having no intention of coming here. And the Holy Spirit of God will draw them to come here to meet an almighty God that gave everything for them so they can have everything in eternity through him. Amen. Father, today we come to you. Lord, we bless your holy name. You're a good God. Lord, and as the song says, even when we don't see you working, you're still working. Lord, even when we don't feel it, Lord, you're a faithful God. You're at work on our behalf. And I pray this year, Lord, as, as you prompt us in our spirit, turn around and say hello to somebody or to ask them how they're doing. Lord, I do pray, Father, that uh, you would, uh, this campus would be holy ground, where the only work that is done here, Lord, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord, by your stripes we are healed. In Jesus' blood and in Jesus' name, I bind Satan from this place. Lord, he has no place here. We belong to you. And Lord, I pray that you help us to walk in the Glory like the fire. 
Titus 3, 4, it says, The kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. It appears every morning when we wake up because His Word tells us His mercies are new every day. We have so much to look forward to as His children, and I look forward to what He has for us in this year and how He's going to bless others.
Yes, he is worthy. As you're seated, if you'll turn your attention, please, to the screens. Thank you. Well, hey, church family. Hey, before I introduce our guest speaker today, I want to thank you all for praying for Paige and me. So some of you all may know already that we're visiting family members on the other side of the world. And I know that so many of you all have been praying for uh, us to, first of all, be able to make this trip and also that your prayers have gone before us and are with us while we're there. So thank you from the bottom of our heart and also for continuing to pray for our kids while they serve. Now then, I want to introduce to you Scott Garoski. Scott and his wife Kelly and their sons Drew and Davis have been longtime friends of Paige and me. They are not only dear friends, we've been able to know them, go on mission trips together with them, watch their family members grow up as they have ours. And so uh, uh, God has given Scott a message to the church. He has an opportunity to speak regularly and preach in various places and also is a part of the ministry uh, led by Greg Burgess and others called Man Church. So he goes and speaks in different places and challenges men to really lead their families and be the servant leaders that God called them to be. Scott is also the, the CEO, the president of Myrick Garoski and Associates, and he's also co-founder of Dulos Partners, which is a missions and church planning organization. So I'm looking forward to listening, uh, recorded that is, listening to what the Lord says through Scott today. And I want you to, even though it's going to be maybe a couple of minutes before he comes up, would you put your hands together and thank the Lord in a warm way for Scott Garoski and his wife, Kelly. And we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm always impressed with how well Les uses technology. Um, I grew up, it's funny, I grew up in Concord, which if I, I drew a map, I drew a line from your church to my home I grew up in, four miles. So I feel right at home here. Um, I'd moved, I know folks from Pleasant Grove, I know there's some folks here from Hueytown. I always thought Concord was the great suburb of Hueytown, the greatest of all suburbs of Hueytown. And so I'm really happy to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Lesson Page, as he said, have, have been dear friends of our family. Um, I know you guys understand how blessed you are to have them uh, as leaders of your church and as a, as a, as a, as a father and a husband, I've been blessed uh, beyond words to their ministry to Kelly and I and to my two sons and my, and my daughter-in-law. So I'm just excited to be here. And I've had two questions already asked me today. He answered one about are we in, involved in the church construction, and we are. The other one is, am I the smart aleck guy that's on Rick and Bubba? And the answer is yes. So if I've offended you on those segments, you probably needed it. Okay, and I want you to get past that and try to hear what I have to say today. Um, John spoke about uh, New Year's resolutions. And as we enter 2022, it was interesting. Um, the most sought after resolution, as you would think, is dieting. Okay? But if you look at New Year's resolutions, they're not kept very well. A study reported that 25% of us quit our New Year's resolutions just after one week. Okay? 36% after one month, and only 9% feel that they've been successful after one year with the New Year's resolution, okay? Now, what's interesting is Stanford in 2018, the University of Stanford, did a study on dieting. And I thought this was very interesting. They had 609 participants, 50% uh, men and 50% women, randomly assigned 50% of those to a low-carb diet, and they assigned 50% to a low-fat diet, and they followed them for one year. So there's been all this debate about which diet's best, which diet, which diet works the best, and the results were kind of staggering. If you see this chart, which you really can't see, but if you could see it, what it says is they're identical. There's no difference. The results are the same. As many people gain weight has lost weight in the same percentages. The, the graphs work parallel to one another. So what does that tell us about diets? 
Well, the people that did lose weight over that year were interviewed, and they said what they learned was that they had to change their relationship with food. If they changed their relationship with food, then it worked. If they just tried to stick by a plan, then it didn't work. I thought, well, that's interesting. Well, what about our spiritual resolutions? It's never bad ever for us to say, okay, Lord, draw me closer to you this coming year. I want to spend more time in prayer. I want to spend more time in Bible study. I want to spend more time in fellowship. I want to do all these things. I'm going to make a resolution that all these things will work to your glory and your benefit. But the truth of the matter is, if you study spiritual resolutions, they have about the same outcome as diets. They just don't, they don't last for the most part. Why, why is that? Well, I would argue that the reason that they don't last is the same reason that the diets don't work. Okay? We have to change our relationship with God for our resolutions to work. And a lot of us, whether intentional or just by, or unintentional, have a poor relationship with God. And our frustrations with God come from that poor relationship. Our frustrations that our resolutions won't work, that we can't stay with a Bible study or a prayer time, it's not because we're not committed to trying to do it, it's because our relationship with God is not where it needs to be. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. If you've never read A.W. Tozer, I would tell you to write that name down and find one of his books. The good news about Tozer is his books are very short. They have to be because you have to read every page like seven times to understand it. He's so deep. But he wrote a book called Knowledge of the Holy. And in that book he said this. What comes in our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or base as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. We tend by a secret law of the soul, to move toward our mental image of God. Now, if you read that in context, it's a very damning statement. What it says is how we imagine God, even before when we go to God in prayer, I've challenged myself on this. When I close my eyes and I get on my knees before God, what do I see in my mind's eye? What am I praying to? Some say, well, I see a white throne, or I see a this or a that. We've got to be really careful with what image we create of our Creator. We're not capable of creating the perfect image of God. So as we let our minds wander, as we create through life circumstances a picture of who God is, if we're not careful, we're going to get a really bad picture of God, and all of a sudden, the big G in God turns into a little g. And now our frustrations are really with the little g, but we're trying to take them out of the big g. Okay, and we're going to talk about a story that, in my opinion, outlines that very well. If you'll go ahead and turn your Bible or your phone to Matthew um, chapter 19. Now, this is going to be a story that most of you have heard. But I think we can learn some things. I know we can, as I have in preparation for this. So, we're going to be in verse 16 where we're going to start, but it's the story of the rich young ruler. Now, what's interesting about this story is it is found in three Gospels. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we learn about the rich young ruler in all three. We take a little bit of something different from each of those three Gospels. Okay, so it's good to look at this story in context across all three Gospels. I've always said that my wife and I were fortunate enough to, to teach student ministry for, ni for 19 years. We taught student ministry. And I always challenge our, our young folks, and I've challenged everybody I've talked to, when we're reading the Bible, the first thing we need to do is, is, is understand the who's. Who's speaking? Who's the speaker speaking to? And then, beyond that, who's the audience? Okay? In this story... Jesus is the speaker. He's speaking to a man we're going to refer to as the rich young ruler. He's also speaking to his disciples. And there are also seekers. There are also others that are following this parade of teaching. So if that's the audience, that's the setting. The next thing that you have to do before you read and understand Scripture is, 
What's the scene? What's going on? Okay, it prevents us from handpicking Scripture and misapplying it in our lives. We need to understand what the scene is. Here's the scene. Jesus has done unbelievable things so far in Matthew. He's walked on water. He's healed multiple people. He's done incredible teachings. There's been the transfiguration. There's been Peter's confession. All of these things have happened. It's this robust time of Christ's teaching. Okay, so there's a heightened awareness. People are ready to hear what God has to say, and Jesus is just force-feeding it. He's just pouring it out and everything that he's doing. So, in walks this rich young ruler, and I'm going to read starting in verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed do I have to do to earn eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said, In which ones? And Jesus said, You should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I've kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go sell. What you possess, give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to the disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So what do we learn? Some of you right now are going, You know what? I'm broke, so this must not apply to me. I'm in good shape. I'll kick back and take a nap. So let's get past that part right up front. This is not a lesson about necessarily about money. Okay? At face value, it seems pretty simple. We've got a rich guy that shows up. He's trying to buy salvation through works or through some other, some other method. Jesus questions him back and forth. And then Jesus says, hey, if you really want it, sell everything you've got. He won't do that. And so then Jesus says, it's impossible for a rich person to go to heaven. That's the summary of the story. We flip the page, you go over, and we start reading some more. But I'm going to challenge us to look at this a lot deeper and see if we can find some application in our life. Rich, poor, doesn't matter. Okay, that's not the gist of the story. Go back, if you would, to where I started in 16. I want you to go back up to verse 13 above that. Now, this is interesting. In all three accounts of this story, in all three Gospels, the way the, the, the Gospels are laid out, and they don't work in chronological order necessarily, but in all three Gospels, right before this starts, our, our, the rich young ruler story, we have, in my Bible, it says, let the children come to me, in verse 13. Now, quickly, what happened there, it's just two verses, but it's imperative for the church. It's imperative for the church. People were bringing children, he says, Luke said, even infants, to Jesus for him just to touch them. Okay? And the disciples said, get them out of here. He didn't have time for this. We're busy. Move on. And he said, Jesus was indignant. He was angry. He said, no, you bring the children to me. Bring the children to me. Here's the interesting part. The very next verse, it says a rich man shows up. Where are the disciples saying, hey, move on. Can't you see the guy's busy? He's tired. Nothing said. Why? Because he's rich, and because he's young, and because he's got influence. In their mind, this is the perfect church member. Now, part of what I do in my company is we, we design, well, not part, that's all we do. We design and disrupt mainly churches throughout the country. We've worked over 300 church projects, more than that as far as churches. I can tell you this, and I want to be accurate, I cannot remember a church that I've been in where the wealthy were not favored. 
they all have seats at the table. When we talk about building, inevitably somebody says, now that guy over there, that guy's made it. That person's, that person's made it happen. He, he's a mover and a shaker. The finance committee walks in, no one's ranting and raving about spiritual gifts. It's all about, have you met Jim? Jim is the guy. You see, inevitably, we have this bend in our, in our life where we treat people with influence and with wealth differently. We just do. A very good friend of mine, pastor of the church um, in another state. I don't want to get into the details of this. And one of the wealthiest men in this country walked into his church one Sunday. And he said there was a buzz around this. This was about eight or ten years ago. And everybody recognized this guy. And after the service was over, he said, deacons, elders, staff, everybody was coming to him and saying, hey, 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 we need to get X, we need to get this guy to speak for us. We need to have a, we are, they started to sign him all these things he could do for the church. And my friend said this, based on his life and based on his own public profession, he's lost. Why in the world would we give him a platform at this church when he says to himself, he's already, he admits himself he's lost. Now here's the beauty of that story. Over a 10 year period, through God's grace, my friend led him to the Lord. And he passed away not long after that. One of the wealthiest men in this country. And he talked about, every time I talked to my friend, I asked about him. And it was a struggle for him to understand not only that his wealth came from God, but his intellect, the way he obtained his wealth came from God. He almost had more of a struggle with that than he had with the money. I'm self-made. I did this. Okay? So that's the struggle this man has. The other thing is this, is that this man needed no introduction. They don't give us a paragraph of, here's how this guy is. Undoubtedly, he walked up. The disciples knew who he was. They knew he had influence. So the next question would be this. Why didn't Jesus send him away? If you look just a few chapters over, you'll find the seven woes that Jesus gives to the Pharisees. And let me tell you, but he lets it go. He wears them out for being religious elitists, for being people who are better than everybody else when they're really not. So why not this guy? He fits the mold. But he really doesn't. I, I call him sincerely ignorant. He's sincere in his ignorance. The story tells us a lot of things about the guy. We know he's religious because he knows the commandments. We know he knows about eternal life, and he knows he doesn't have it. Okay? And he's worried because, like a lot of us, he's done everything he can think to do, yet in his heart he knows if something happened to him today, he wasn't going to spend eternal life. And he has three questions that I want us to highlight in our Bibles or our phones if we can that we have to ask, that God responds to us in the same way I think he responds to him. The first question is found um, in verse 16. Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Now, what this introduces to us is not only bad theology, but it's common theology. Especially, we're, let's give this guy a little bit of a break. The New Testament had not been written yet. Jesus has not died on the cross and risen from the dead. This guy's still living in an Old Testament teaching. He's, and, he, and, he's, and he's wealthy, which means he's probably been taught his entire life. He's trying to get past that. He doesn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. He's not where his disciples are yet. This guy's struggling, and he's trying to find the right answer. And he says, what can I do? And you would think Jesus would go, come on, buddy. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus is very patient with him, okay? This came to me when I was looking at this. He's asking, what can I do for life? If you spell that out, that spells idle. I do, D-O, L for life. Anytime you start a conversation in your mind with somebody else about what you can do when it comes to your salvation, you've created an idol. Just put a, just put a period on it. You got you an idol. We don't bring anything to Jesus. I, I hate to break that to y'all. He brings it all to us. We don't bring anything to him. All we bring to Jesus is sin. That's it. And he just takes care of that. 
So anything in our life that starts with I do, what can I do? You've already started three, your three, your three letters into idle. And Jesus recognized that. Then he asked the second question, which commandments do I have to keep? Well, that's an odd question. Because I would think the answer Jesus would give back is all of them. Because Jesus is going to try to make a point here. The law is written to make it obvious to all of us that we can't keep it. But Jesus doesn't say that. Again, he's not trying to push this guy away. If this guy, Jesus sees his heart and knows the guy is trying, and Jesus is trying with him. He's, people talk about, I think it's an overused term, God meets me where I am, but I tell you what, it applies right here. God is, Jesus is right there where he is, trying to get in him, his life, and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just track with you. I'm not going to get ahead of you. I'm going to track right here with you. Okay? And he says, which ones do I have to keep? Now, he's already broken the first two. He's already broken that you shall have no other gods before me. His money's taking care of that. And you can't create idols. His money's taking care of that. So he's already got two he's knocked off. God, Jesus didn't go to those two. Jesus talk, goes to the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth commandment. Okay? I'll read those. He says, and they're in reverse order. You should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, honor your mother and father. Okay? What's significant about these is that these are the five observable commandments. These are the five commandments that you and I can see someone else carrying out. So Jesus said, that's fine. I'm going to throw the ones out that all of us can watch you do and watch you, watch you fail at, honestly. But the guy still didn't get it. He's still like, I've kept all of those. Now, of course, if we're Jesus at that point in time, we go, hey, look, I've been patient, but this is enough, okay? Obviously, you have a very bad view of yourself, but he doesn't say that. He goes on to the third question. What do I still lack? What an interesting comment. He's just confessed to Jesus Christ that he's kept the commandments. Jesus himself is the only one who's ever kept the commandments. That's why he said before that, why do you talk about good? Only God's good. But he still realizes, even in his mind, that he's kept the commandments. There's something here that says, you know what? I'm, I'm not there. I'm not where I need to be. My life's not where it needs to be. I've done everything the law tells me to do. I'm not there. So you said, okay, that's fine. Here's what you lack. Sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. And listen to how Jesus says it. In verse 21. If you would be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, when you first read that, you say, eh, that's, that's not good theology. Selling your possessions doesn't have anything to do with eternal life. That really goes against Scripture, and we know that's not right. So what's going on here? It's, it's not that difficult. Jesus knows that if this man would get rid of his idol and follow him, he will be saved. Jesus is speaking to him in the future. If you'll put this idol down and you'll come follow me, you're going to have treasure in heaven. You're going to get this. This void in your heart that you're battling and fighting is going to be filled and you'll have treasure in heaven. It has much less to do with the money and everything to do with the lordship and the fellowship that he's asking for out of the rich young ruler and out of us. So then what? The man left sad because his possessions were great. He couldn't give it up. Even though he knew he needed to, he couldn't get rid of it. So Again, a lot of us are going, you know what, but that's not me because I don't really have that much. My possessions are kind of meager. So I'm really attached to them. I thought the same thing. And I thought, you know, our reliance is a little more discreet. It's not as out front as this guy's was. So what if we change the story? What if we, what if we apply the story to our problems, to our idols? We don't like hearing that word. So I don't have any hours in my life. I hope you don't. But let's look at it. 
I went through my list. I thought to myself, well, what's God asking me to give up? My pride? Hey, I'm a self-made man. Okay? I love God, but just like my friend who's, who had the guy come to his church, I may love you, God, but I can promise you I made the money on my own. Okay? There's an idol. How about your family? I think the one thing that every human that's ever lived is that in common. One thing is that we all fear loss. All of us fear loss. I don't care who you are, we're terrified of loss. I fear the loss of my wife, my children, my sister and my daughter in law, my nephew. I fear loss. And as John pointed out, 2021 has been an abundance of loss. It's been an abundance of loss for our family. An abundance. We've had two this year. We buried the under age 23 and under in our family. I'm not, we're not alone in that. I'm just telling you, loss. Loss can become my idol because I'm going to cling to it. I'm going to hold on to it because I like it. It's something I'm so terrified of that I'm afraid if I let go of it, it's going to happen. So I'm going to spend my entire day and night trying to prepare myself for something that I just cannot prepare myself for. That's an idol. That's something I'm clinging to instead of Jesus. It's not money. It's something to me far more sinister and a lot harder to weed out of our lives. What about prejudice? Oh, man, don't talk about that. I was raised this way and I was raised that way. All that is is a little God in your life. That's all that it is. It's arrogance. It's choosing to be something that God's asked you not to be, God's commanded you not to be, regardless of what your prejudice may be. It's not money. It's a lot harder to see. It's a lot harder to discern. It's even harder to admit. What about my addictions? Oh, I'm not addicted. What about that drinking problem that your wife's been on you about or your husband's been on you about? What about that pornography problem you got that no one knows about except you and God? Well, nobody has to know about that, Gorowski. The only person that has to know is Jesus, and let me tell you something, he knows. And there are no exceptions to the rule that I'm going to have all of Jesus, but I'm going to keep this for myself. Nope, that's just an idol. And this goes away. It goes back to what Tozer said. What are we thinking of? Jesus doesn't have room for that garbage. There's no space for it. None. Well, you don't know how I've been treated in my life. You don't know how my family's treated me. You don't know the abuse I've endured. You don't know the way I was raised. And you're right, I don't. But Jesus does Hanging on to that is an idol. It's between you and Jesus. It's not something he has, it's something you've got that you want to hold on to in your life. And man, what about the loss? What about the hurt? I was out here 10 years ago when that horrific tornado ripped through here. The day after it happened, I was in Concord visiting friends of mine who had lost a lot. And I remember standing in his place, and I looked back this way, and I just stared. I remember just staring. And I said to a friend of mine, what is that? He said, that's Pleasant Grove. I had no idea how close we were because all the trees were gone. I was in this church within a week or two after that. I saw the slaps. I saw the devastation. Some of you might not be past that yet. Some of you might be holding that little bit in there and saying, you know what, God, I love you, but you still let this happen. You still cause this. The weather answers to you. So I'm not going to let that go. We'll discuss that when we get to heaven. Okay, you and I will figure that out when we get face to face. Man to man, eye to eye. You just got your idol set up. An idol of pain. An idol that God and Jesus wants to just take from you and rid you of. And you can't move forward. See, here's the frustration. We're frustrated because we're kneeling to God with a big G. 
and we're praying to God as little g. We want our big God to deal with our small God questions. See, my little God's got these little things I keep over here to my side. They may not be money again, but there's something else. But I'm going to pray to the big God, see if he can fix that, but I want my little God to hang around. You've only got one of these. There's no space in our, in our God. The sovereign God has no space for the little God. It's clear throughout Scripture. So now what? I can't do this. Grosky is too much. You're asking me to let go of things in my life I can't do, just like the rich young ruler. And I turn over and I read Matthew. You don't have to turn there, but it's just a couple chapters over. In Matthew chapter 11. Okay? And I, and I hear what Jesus says. He says this in chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am a gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At the end of the day, that's all he's asking the rich young ruler is to do this. I want to lighten your load. Okay? I want to make it easier. I want to make it harder. I know you feel like you can't let go of this because that's your idol and that's your, that's your, that's your effort. That's your progress. But I'm saying to you, if you let this go, the burden's going to be a lot less on you. The yoke's a lot easier. It's a lot lighter. Look at verse 23. of chapter uh, 19. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will the rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. There's never been a camel that Jesus sat on that couldn't go through the eye of a needle. Not one. The question is not about the rich. The disciples say it. Who can be saved? If this guy can't be saved, then who can be? And Jesus said, no one. That's the story. Salvation is impossible without me. But with me, everything's possible. Even riding this camel through the eye of the needle. It's only possible. It's going to happen. The problem is, the camel has no room for all the rest of our stuff. We can't load up the camel with all of our problems and all of our idols, all of our issues. We refuse to give to God that we want to carry and say, now God, I'm going to grab this. I'm going to throw it back of this camel with you. I want you to cruise to that needle for me. Jesus goes, nope, that's not how it works. You've got to drop all that. You've got to leave the loss, the hurt, the pain, the money. Anything in your life, you've got to leave it. You've got to come follow me, and we can ride through all the needles. You don't even go bump your head. But without me, you'll never get through it. That need was impossible without me. You see, for the rich man, this was his problem. It was his money. That's not all of our problems. But each of us have something that we're trying to saddle up to Jesus and say, hey, if you just take this, if you just take care of my grandkids, if you'll just take care of my grandkids, never let my grandkids have a hair on their head hurt, ever, be God, I'm all yours. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, I got your grandkids, and by the way, I love your grandkids infinitely more than you love them. I want what's best for them infinitely more than you do. See, we don't need to have conditional terms with Jesus like the rich man did. Okay? And oftentimes, it's just not, again, our wealth that prevents us. Let me finish with this. What in your life is preventing you from getting through that needle. Don't miss tradition. Please don't miss that. The scariest verse of scripture 
is when Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, I did these things in your name. And they, they have a pretty impressive list, by the way. It's prophesying, speaking in tongues, healing. <clears throat> what does Jesus say? I never knew you. He's talking to the churchmen. He's talking to the religious elite. He's not talking to the rich young ruler. He's not talking to the lost guy who's sincerely seeking out of ignorance. He's speaking to the religious elite. You, I used all these things for your glory, God. And God said, I never knew you. Don't think for a second that our traditions have room with Jesus. They don't. They just don't. I don't know, I don't know your pain, and I don't know the loss, I don't know the experiences, and you don't know mine, and I don't have to know it to know that Jesus is the answer. I don't have to admit it to know that Jesus is the answer. Some of you could have this same feeling in your heart that this rich young girl had, I know I'm here every Sunday. I participate. I'm ashamed to walk down front because everybody in this church will laugh and say, you know what? I thought that person was saved 30 years ago. You're going to let that prevent you from a relationship with Jesus? That's pride. There's another idol. That's the big one. That's the one that got Satan thumped out. Pride. Started all this problem. I'm asking you today to whatever that is in your life to surrender to Jesus. Let him fulfill your, 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 your eternal destiny and let him take you through these needles in life by carrying the bags for you, okay? John's going to come down front. I'm going to pray for us. And after I pray, if you want to come down front to speak to God on your terms, to talk to John or myself, you're certainly welcome. God, we're thankful for all the things you do in our life. And Lord, we're thankful for the things you do in abundance that we don't even recognize, Lord, the graces and mercies you show us that are unrecognizable in our lives. God, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for teaching and understanding. I'm grateful, Lord, that you allow us to examine ourselves. I'm grateful that when we look at others, we often need to reflect on our own selves. I thank you for our time together. Lord, if there are people in this congregation or online, watching this, Lord, to need to make decisions in their life to rid themselves of these bags they carried around. I pray that they would. They would see freedom in you, Lord. For it's in your name I pray these things and ask these things, God. Amen.
did speak to all of us, didn't it? We all have little G's, don't we? There's so many churches that are think they're doing it right. And they're getting the reward right then. Because it's more about them. I think it's A.W. Tozer I read earlier this week that said, are you serving God or are you serving people? Because if you're trying to please people, you can't be a servant of God. And that's so true from what God used him to say today. I pray that this sunk deep into your heart and it will come up this week a lot through the Holy Spirit. And I pray that for you. I pray that for me that we take stock of our life while we do the things that we do. And who are we really serving? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing ourselves out. Please come down and express this wonderful family and, and Brother Scott, your appreciation for them. Uh, that really was a word from the Lord never heard that scripture preached that way, but that's for all of us. If we can make sure in our life that everything belongs to God, I promise you this, this year will be a, a year like none other at First Baptist Pleasant Grove. Amen. When it's so big that we can't take credit for it, that's what men like to do is take credit. When it's so big that the only thing you can say, but God, that is what it's going to bring revival to this church. It's going to bring revival to a pleasant grove and surrounding areas. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for the day. Lord, I thank you for this uh, such timely message today from Brother Scott. I thank you for his precious family being here. Father, we pray your richest blessings on them. Father, we pray for your favor for them and for all those that are watching and that will watch. Lord, we pray for your favor. Lord, spiritually this year, physically, emotionally, mentally, and financially. Lord, remind us as you bless us this year. You don't bless us to keep. You bless us to be a blessing. Because, Lord, that's what when people see Jesus in us. When we get nothing in return, but we do it because we love our Lord and we love the lost. Lord, help us to remember, Lord, as... Uh, you're children of God. Lord, we don't gather on Sundays to entertain. We gather, Lord, for you to use us to win the lost and to disciple them to turn around and do the same thing. Help us, Lord, this year to be about the main thing. Lord, I pray that you'd wipe politics away from this church and every church in the world. I pray that we'd be real, Father. There wouldn't be hierarchy, Lord, but it'd be all of us serving you together. In love, I pray, Father, that we be a church of grace and love. Grace because you've had grace on us. Lord, we're so, so guilty. Lord, of judging people and forming opinions. And Lord, all of that is straight from the pits of hell. Help us to love like you love. Lord, do something supernatural this year in our lives and in your church. Lord, I hear about churches that are closing. Lord, man's church is in trouble, but God's church is never in trouble. So, Father, I pray that you'd fill this church with your love, with your grace, with your peace, that we get right with each other, we get right with you. I thank you for this man of God that delivered this message. Lord, we ask it, we believe it, and through faith, Lord, we celebrate it in the wonderful and holy name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Open up the heavens, we want to see you.